Welcome to Lucidity, Dreams and Observations. This series by High Priestess Zola Lucky Stars for those interested in dreams. Why dream recall is important, the exploration of other dimensions and states of reality, which is what dreaming actually is, why, how you can benefit from the practice of dream recall in your own life. Lucidity is the capacity to perceive the truth directly and instantaneously. The dictionary definition says a presumed capacity, but it's really a capacity. It's that sensation of knowing that we get, which comes from the gut, the solar chakra, and the gut is never wrong. This is also the power of an empath, one who can look at or listen to somebody and perceive if they're lying or telling the truth. The capacity to perceive truth is a facet of Satanism that must needs be cultivated. Satan is the god of truth after all. We follow truth. We spend 33% of our lives sleeping while the body rests and repairs itself. Our spiritual essence contained within the astral body is awake, aware, and out there somewhere. This is one reason why it's good practice to record your dreams. Another is that that act of focusing the will to remember actually strengthens your recall and leads eventually to spontaneous lucidity while still in the dream. You are literally carving new neural pathways in the brain by doing this. With more effort and practice, you can extend your lucidity. Why? Because there is much more to this reality than the drudgery of the nine to five. We're not merely flesh and blood, we're spirit, non-physical. This non-physical essence, which survives physical death, goes forth every night to have experiences in the astral body. Whether you consciously remember or not, you're doing this. Why wouldn't it be preferable to be able to remember and learn from these experiences? As part of my spiritual practice, I try to keep track of my dreams, devote time to record I've been at this off and on for over 30 years. I always do the old fashioned way of writing it down, but lately I decided to try audio recording instead. I can express what's coming to me that way without being slowed down by not being able to type fast enough. Satan inspired me to share some of these dreams and the observations and memories generated by them with you all. This is like a radio show. There's no real visuals to speak of, except, you know, the intro, obviously. However, I invite you to tune in, sit and listen on the bus or train, long haul trucking while at work, etc. So this was a very odd dream. <laughs> um, started off where I was at a keyboard and I had this big display in front of me and I was answering this questionnaire and it had to do with, you know, like world events and what's really going on in the world and what's really going on in the world. And uh, I think there were 72 questions and I got 57, I think it was 54 or 57 out of um, whatever number I just said. It's already leaving my brain. I'm trying to say this quickly before it's all gone. But uh, um, yeah, and so, you know, when there's some quizzes that you take and when you get the results, it'll say, oh, it's pretty good or no, that wasn't very good showing or yes, yeah, smashed it, you know. And so it came up on the screen, you smashed it. <laughs> And, um, uh, whatever. And then I got up to go over to this other control panel because I wanted to shut all that stuff down at that point. Hmm. And my so-called mother was standing there, except I'll tell you, my mother never looked like that. Um, this woman was tall and really gorgeous and... I'd say she was at least 6'4". Uh, she was very tall, really pale-skinned. She had these really blue eyes, and her hair was 
oh my god it was like um not quite like white but almost silver like and it had this very faint blue gray tinge to it that almost glowed it really looked spectacular and and she had it pulled up and around her and i looked at her and i said my god you ever look good and she said thank you and i said like seriously i said i love that hair it's fantastic <laughs> i said you really need to do a photo shoot with that i said that is incredible and then I went back to my main desk. Oh, excuse me. And the chair was gone. And I thought, what the hell? You know, somebody took my chair. So I started looking for it. I started, I started walking around and looking for this chair. And it wasn't there, wasn't there. And then I cut back towards my console just in time to see this tall um, guy with short white hair and sort of a, a lab coat on and he I hope this thing's recording I'm gonna stop for a second and see yeah sorry about that interruption but I have done done recordings before and the anime will interfere and make sure that it's not actually registering <laughs> it's not recording and you just spend 30 minutes thing and then you find out it wasn't recording or it shut itself off so I just wanted to make sure so I saw this man and he was wearing like I said he had short white hair he looked like he was a white guy um, fairly tall maybe six foot dark pants and a white lab coat and I saw him pushing this chair into position and then he took off he'd, he'd basically stolen my chair and then replaced it with this crappy chair and I thought you you're not gonna get away with this right so I went after him and um, he'd gotten out of sight around the corner but I seemed to be in a kind of a school or something like there were classrooms and stuff and I and I just said fuck it you know and I started sticking my head into each room and taking a look around and people are looking at me like what are you doing and I just was like I don't care I'm looking for this dude until I find him and I interrupted a lot of different rooms and I didn't give them any explanation I just said don't mind me just nothing to see here just go on about your business I'm just looking for somebody and then I just kept going and there was some rooms where they were actually doing operations to people which was really weird and creepy um, yeah that was really weird and creepy and, and then some other rooms seemed to be set up as nurseries or something except these are like big communal kind of and they were they were down below in tunnels um just again really creepy and i was going like what the hell is this and i thought i don't have time for this i'm trying to find the dude with the chair and i kept going <sighs> excuse me so that's right eventually i came around a corner and there was more people there and they were doing whatever they were doing i don't know looked very busy though there was a lot of things happening and this one man turned around saw me and went oh for god he goes okay fine he goes you know what just take the damn chair he says i don't i don't need any of this from you and he sort of indicated towards the back area and i went back there and there was my chair but it had like a camera mounted on it and actually had been booby trapped and there was this camera mounted on it and the technology was such and that's kind of hard to explain but basically if I'd put my hands on my own chair at that point it would have grabbed a hold of my astral self and thrown it into a sort of a maze where I would have been left to wander and there was no exit and I somehow instinctively understood this when I saw the chair and I thought god do you think you're so smart and I turned right around and I went after this man and I thought I'm gonna you know I'm gonna do something to you right <laughs> now I'm really mad 
And uh, yeah, I went uh, again, I went through different rooms and sections and, and so on and so on. And eventually I found who I was looking for. And I said, you're going to come with me and you're going to untrap that chair for me. And he said, you don't want to be doing this. And I said, no, no, no. I said, no, no, you're the one that made the mistake trying to take something that belongs to me. He goes, well, it was sort of in this big area. And I didn't, I said, yeah, that's my studio. And you shouldn't have been in my studio. And you certainly shouldn't have been in there shopping for things for yourself, right? I said, you know, you do realize you're in the wrong, right? And he didn't say anything. And I said, well, you're going to come with me now and you're going to take off whatever that is that you put on that chair. And I said, and thanks for, by the way, for trying to trap me or trick me into falling into that trap. That was really sweet. I said, it's not going to work though. And grabbed him by his ankles because he didn't want to walk. So I grabbed him by his ankles and I started dragging him like a piece of meat through the hallways and he was laying there like a victim and just letting me bounce and bounce him along and you know there's this part of the alley that we were in was rather rough and there was a lot of um, stones and uneven projections and so he's getting kind of beat up as I'm dragging him along and people are looking at that and they're going oh my god what are you doing to him oh my god you're so mean what are you doing oh you're so bad so he was busy playing the victim and allowing me to do this so that I would look bad. <laughs> Which is a common tactic of the enemy, right? They love to, um, they'll incite something. And then when you do something to rectify the situation or take a, a stand against the injustice and try to do something about it, they'll scream that you're a, a racist or a xenophobe or a, you know, that that kind of thing right um, it's really interesting the way these evil things work and it's there it was happening in my dream and it suddenly snapped me into lucidity and then I was I was lucid and I looked at him again and I realized that all the time I'd been dragging him along he was he was actually shape-shifting and the thing that I was dragging along was no longer even slightly human looking I mean it was so strange and weird looking that honestly I can't it's very hard to even describe it <sighs> excuse me mm. I just woke up and I had to rush to the computer and record this because it's so strange so yeah the legs had I'm gonna try and describe it the legs were really distorted and backwards like you'd see on a canine and they were hairless and in fact, he wasn't even wearing pants anymore. And it seemed to be naked skin. And that skin was um, rough and scaly and brown. And then it had sort of a human shaped body, but um, the head was really weird and wrong. And um, yeah, it looked like a lizard or something, you know, it, it, it still had two arms and the five-fingered hand kind of thing except the fingers ended in claws and it's laying there and it's not even fighting me right and I've still got a hold of his ankle because I've dropped one of them and now I had only one ankle in my hand and I said you know what I said why don't you just go right ahead and shape shift into what you really look like I said, why don't you just go ahead and do that I'm sure it wouldn't it wouldn't be an improvement <laughs> you're ugly no matter what right and it did start to morph some more and shift a bit more and at that part it's it finally decided okay I've had enough of playing with you and it moved to attack me and I reached out and grabbed it and then we were sort of staggering back and forth and um, he had me by the neck and I had put my hands out and I had my hands on its chest trying to push it off and it was really strong and it was trying to choke me I guess except of course in that 
it's astral state. I mean, you don't really need to breathe, right? Because it's not like it is here in the physical dimension. Um, for example, if you're lucid and you know that you're lucid in the dream, you can go well, you can go right under the water and you know explore around down down underwater, and you don't need to breathe. So I wasn't sure what he was doing there, but yeah, he was trying to strangle me. And I suddenly said, you know what? I said, I'm a high priestess of Satan. I said, in the mighty name and by his power, I said, by the power of Satan, I want you to get the F off me. And at first that didn't seem to have any effect. And that's because I don't think there was a lot of power that I, behind what I'd said because I wasn't really feeling it and I started to get angry at that point. And I got really, really angry and, and I felt this power suddenly in my hands like they were sizzling and crackling and um, I said by his mighty name and in his power, I said by the power of Satan, I said you are going to get off me now. And, and I reached out and grabbed a hold of him and um geez, it's the weirdest thing because even just telling you this I can feel that crackling in the palms of my hands again it's hard to really explain but um, somehow yeah I started compressing him compressing him by the power of the will I guess the mind but um, and also my hands were just blazing with this blue fire this this lightning and, it, and I could feel it like I'm feeling it right now talking about it wow that's just wild um, I said you messed with the wrong person I said I am a high priestess of Satan and I work for him and you fucked with the wrong chick and I just kept I just kept blasting him with blast after blast of this lightning and um, compressing him at the same time until he was the size of a hockey puck in between my hands and then he was still trying to resist and I was pressing inwards with my palms and, I, and um, suddenly my hands came together and he'd been crushed out of there like pushed back to his own dimension or you know, I don't think I killed him, literally, but I, I definitely banished him and pushed him back into his own dimension where he comes from. Um, and then I woke up, well, right before I woke up, excuse me, um, so I, I crushed him back to his own dimension. Then I looked down at my hands and there was literally these rings of white blue light that were like going vroom, 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 like across my across my the insides of my hands starting from the center point of my palm and then expanding outwards in these concentric rings of light and and sometimes there would be crackles of lightning that would kind of and they'd go across as well and it was just wild <laughs> and um the, the thing that, that I found really fascinating was how strongly I could feel it. I could really feel it. And I was looking at it going, wow, that was so cool, right? Um, and then I woke up and I thought, I really need to get over here and record this one. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, and I'm sitting here with my eyes closed recounting that for you and I'm telling you I'm feeling it right now I can feel that energy crackling in my hands um, super interesting dream I mean if I was gonna try to if I was gonna interpret that you know if you were going if I was going to interpret that dream right on one level you can say that everything in the dream relates to yourself and so in that sense, perhaps there's another part of me that's trying to sabotage myself for what I'm doing. And I'm fighting with that nasty, ugly, negative entity part. Because we all have a dark side, right? Um, you, could, you could look at it that way. You could also look at it on the level of... Sometimes our dreams show us other things and it's really not that much about us. It's about what's actually going on out there. And all that stuff about the rooms with people being operated on and 
the rooms that were set up for children? I'm not so sure. I, I don't know. And that whole concept of the booby trap chair with the, uh, when you touch it, your astral form, I already was in the astral somewhere. I mean, perhaps it's the emotional form and the next one that's up the ladder. I don't know, but, or perhaps it's, it did suck your astral form as in your whole self that's lucid there in the dream and it sucks it into this kind of like a pocket dimension where you're, just, you're trapped in a maze that you can't get out of, right? There is no real exit. There's only an entrance, which is a really icky, creepy idea. And I don't know, I don't know why I would think of that. And it's interesting that it was on the end, um, it was set up to look like a camera and this camera was recording everything around it. And I don't know, that just really, I don't know, it puts me in mind of how they're, you know, with all these smart cities and everything's going to be like on camera and they are watching everything and the big daddy sort of concept to that nanny state, that 1984 state that's constantly watching through the scanners and I mean, that's where, that's where these aliens want to take us, right? That's, that's where they're trying to push humanity. They want us going in that direction. And it, so when I see that kind of things in my dream, I see it more as an intrusion of their consciousness, trying to, uh, trying to put themselves into my, um, dreams and then influence me or something, I, you know, and, and the one that, that set up that camera to record what was going on in my dreams was this thing that um, absolutely not human and it's interesting um, it's interesting because when you just now I've, I've come across this in different dreams as well where if I'm being attacked by something Usually if you use the name Satan, it'll help, but they don't want you saying that name. And so you'll find yourself suddenly unable to form words. You'll be going, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> you, you can't, you can't speak. Uh, something prevents you from speaking. Um, yeah. And, and it's a real conscious effort to try to drag those words out and very, very difficult to pronounce them. Uh, this time around, I didn't have that problem. I could say the words clearly. And in fact, I was really projecting them with a lot of force. And that stupid beeping thing that you're hearing, yes, I know that it's this thing that needs a battery, but you know what? I've taken that thing apart and tried to fix it and I can't, so you're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> and I know it's annoying. I try to cut it out when I edit to cut out as many of the, those bleeps as I can, but anyway, that's why it's there. Yeah, they'll, they'll actually try to prevent you from saying his, his name aloud, right? And I found that really interesting as well, that there wasn't anything preventing me from speaking Satan's name that time. I had no problem, you know, in his name and by his, by his power. I am ordering you to be gone. Get the F out of my dreams and out of my face right now <laughs> or suffer the consequences. And... And wow, I'm telling you, man, that, uh, that lightning fire, that, that, wow, that was really, that was really neat. So anyway, I just wanted to, to uh, record this one because I thought it was interesting and I'm going to stop now. And when I have another dream, I'll record that one. Uh, bye for now. Do you know, I was just, I was just re-listening to my dream there so that I can edit out all the blank spaces and whatever. And I suddenly remembered the rest of the dream. <laughs> yeah, so I'm standing there looking at my hands with the, with the blue and white lightning 
sort of the concentric rings of power that are kind of like going whoosh, whoosh across the, the, the surface of my hand and feeling it, like just feeling it too. And it was very crackly and just really an interesting feeling. And suddenly there was a man there beside me and he put his arm around me and he said, well, that was well done. He said, very good job. And I said, oh, you know, thank you. He says, I'll walk you back to your, to your studio. And I went, oh, okay. And there was this really, um, <laughs> there was this definite energy, let's just say between us. Okay. And he was very tall and very, very handsome. And I said, you know, I, I put my hand out and I looked down at it. I'd, I'd slipped my right arm around his waist, you know, and I pulled out my left hand and I looked down at it and he had his arm draped around my shoulders. And so I looked down at my hand where you could still see these rings and, and crackling bits of energy in my hand. And I said, yeah, I said, check this out. Isn't this interesting? I said, I wonder how that would feel. And then I grabbed him, you know, where. <laughs> And he went, oh my God. <laughs> and he got this instant erection. Right? <laughs> he said, oh my God. He said, you're killing me. <laughs> I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to find a spot somewhere and we'll just have to finish you off then. <laughs> and um, yeah, we found this area with a nice big divan and he stretched it on that and I climbed on top of him. <laughs> I'm just laughing because it's just funny. Uh, yeah, because he was just so like into it, you know, and his eyes were closed and he was just going, oh my God, oh my God. Because every time I touch him with my hands, it, I was I was actually hitting him with this energy too. <laughs> and... Yeah, he really enjoyed himself. Let's just leave it at that. And then afterwards, and this was kind of interesting, I climbed off him, and there were three other people that had entered the room. There were two men and a woman, and the two men looked at the woman, and they said, did you do it? And she says, snaps her fingers, and she says, it's done. And the man that I'd just pleasured looked at her and said, did you say something just now? Something secret that I wasn't supposed to hear? And those three started laughing because they just mind wiped him and he didn't remember the time he'd just spent with me. And I just thought, that is so weird. <laughs> Why did they do that? Um, and, and then I woke up. Yeah, so that was a very interesting dream and lots of fun. Um, that that bit of fun with the man was I'm not getting into the details even though I can remember them but I'm not going to get into those details that's my business um, except to say that, that it was a lot of fun <laughs> um, yeah he was he had to have been like six four six four six five he had long blonde hair he was really handsome and that's all i'm gonna say about that so yeah uh, yeah so i should have gotten up earlier and tried to record this <laughs> But I didn't want to get out of bed and I went back to sleep. Of course, when I woke up, even though I told myself, you'll remember it, <laughs> a lot of it's gone, but. So even though I've forgotten a fair bit of the dream, the part that really stood out for me was when I got lucid. Yeah. Some stuff had been happening before that. But 
but what I do remember is that, I don't know, something made me lucid, and I looked all around and I said, well, you know, I want to go see Sorath. I want to see Sorath. I'd really like to see Sorath, if that's okay with him. And... <sighs> that's all right with him and I flung myself through the nearest wall and when I came out the other side I came up backwards and it was like falling into a deep well and this has happened before it was this this other time the same thing happened where I had become lucid in a dream and I'd said I want to go and see Sora Anyway, when I was facing forward, when I went through the, the wall, when I came out the other side, I was facing backwards and I fell like as if I was falling into an elevator shaft. And I just fell and, and you really felt that downward momentum, you know, and I just like fell and fell. It's quite a sickening feeling. And like in the end, it was funny because even while it was happening, I remembered how the same thing had happened the last time. <laughs> so I didn't fight that, that feeling. I actually went with it and willed myself to drop even faster. And then eventually, instead of falling backwards, I was facing forwards and falling. It's hard to describe, but I fell through different levels of dimensions it, it's I, I guess the best way that I can think of to liken it to would be like if you were diving in deep water and you go through a region that's really cold and then suddenly you pass this thermal barrier and then you're in a region where the water's warmer and suddenly there's different things in the water and there's plankton or I don't know and then you, you pass through yet another barrier and the water is lighter and brighter and there's more life in it. There's more fish that you can see. Do you know what I mean? Like it, there's no perceptible barrier. And yet when you pass through it, you can sense it. And that's what it felt like going through that, going through that tunnel, that, <sighs> going through that tunnel, that wormhole, whatever the hell it is. And I've experienced it before now. This is the second time where I've been lucid and I've said, I want to see Sorath and I've gone through this tunnel. And so my understanding, which was kind of instinctive as I'm, as it's happening is that no, I'm not underwater. These aren't thermal layers like that. It's just the best analogy I can give you, but you're actually going through different, different kind of dimensions because he's a ways away from us. He's not here, you know, so he's somewhere else. So I went, I went flashing through all these different sort of dimensions until eventually, <sighs> Till eventually I emerged in this gigantic chamber and um, that's kind of difficult to describe but imagine imagine a crater from a meteorite impact with a sort of a pointed tip in the middle of it and then imagine that that's been filled with seats and that hundreds and hundreds thousands 20,000 people, I don't know, are sitting there. And the person, the people that are up at the, on the point in the middle. No, it's not that big, though. It's, um... I, I would say it's about the size of, like, a, uh, an average football stadium. Now, I don't know how many people that holds. 10,000? 20,000? And I came out I don't know, out of thin air, <laughs> because I found myself coming out sort of towards the center of this big space and up in the air. And there was a man that was seated with a bunch of other people. And he was seated sort of in the tip of the middle. And the feeling I got was that they were sitting perhaps in council, um, Maybe it was some kind of a jury or a court. I, I wasn't really sure, but it felt kind of formal and I didn't want to interrupt. And so when I, when I came in, 
I didn't really want to interrupt, you know, so, you know, I, I came in, I had a chance to kind of look around and go, wow, where the hell is this? And all these people, most of them didn't even bother to notice me, but he did. And the man was sitting sort of towards the center of all of this on that upraised portion. And yes, he was sitting on this upraised portion with other people. He was just one of the leaders, put it that way. And he sensed me right away and he turned right around and he stared up at me with this surprised look on his face, like, what the hell? And he saw me and he's, I could feel his, I could see his face light up, you know, and he was kind he started kind of beaming at me like, cause, oh my God, like the feeling was like when you see someone that you know and you really like, but you never expected to see them there and you're sort of grinning and going like, I can't believe you're here <laughs> at the same time. And <sighs> excuse me. And he watched me come on in and down and I managed to find a spot. There was a chair that was uh, sort of a, not really, they weren't really chairs. They were more like these long benches. And I found a long bench that didn't have too many people on it. And there was room and I sat myself down there, settled myself on the bench. So I'm kind of um, off to his left hand uh, shoulder slightly behind him and he had kind of turned his head to watch me and he sort of gave me this smile and, and um and then he turned back to his business you know what he was doing because obviously you know they were busy right and they were in the middle of doing something I'm not really sure what and the interesting thing is that while they were having all these conversations while they were having these conversations they were all doing it tele telepathically. I mean, yeah, they could speak out loud if they wanted to, but most of the conversation was going on telepathically. <laughs> um, so what did he look like? Well, he was dressed in a uh, uniform. It looked kind of military. It, was, um, it wasn't in dark colors for a change, which is how he usually dresses, but uh, these were like hands and creams, um, really tailored, um, nice looking, very nice looking with, um, gold trim kind of reminded me of like dress, dress formals, you know, um, and he was very tanned. He, wherever he'd been, he'd been in the sun. And he cut his long blonde hair actually short, and it was it was, it was uh, fairly short. I guess he was trying out a new look. I don't know. Um, he wasn't wearing a hat or anything, any kind of a headpiece. And like I said, he was pretty tanned, so he'd been somewhere. I don't know where. And he had a whole staff of like twenty or thirty that were sort of around him in a half arc circle, you know. And yeah, and they were, I don't know what they were doing. They were, like I said, mm. yeah, it's kind of hard to, like I said, because I wasn't in on the telepathic flow. I just could feel it happening all around me. And the sensation I got was that it was part of like, almost like a uh, like a jury, like, like they were judging a bunch of other people's performance or something. Um, but also giving them news, sharing news. Like it was kind of like a meeting and yeah. So anyway, that was about that. I never did get to speak to him. He was busy. <laughs> that was about it. Right. Um, that was, that's about it that I can remember, but I just, now, what I want to go back to is when I came out into this dark space and started falling into it, it's like down an elevator shaft. The other time, it was the same kind of thing. I became lucid in the dream and I declared out loud, I want to go see Sorath now. If he's not busy, I want to see him. I want to see him now. <laughs> and ran, ran through the nearest wall. And this is just a little... 
I don't know. It's, it's this weird trick that I like to do. And it actually works. <laughs> so when you become lucid, and you can, you can actually throw yourself through the floor doing it too, if there's no walls available, but I prefer to just walk into a wall. So I'll become lucid in the dream. I'll declare my intention out loud. Okay, this is where I want to go. And I'll step through the wall. And when you step out the other side, usually you're where you want it to go. <sighs> it doesn't, it doesn't work a hundred percent of the time, but it works a lot. Like about, about 80, 85% of the time it, it will work. And I think whether it works or not is linked to how great your desire or will is and your conviction that you will indeed come out where you were meant to go. And if you kind of have a lot of doubt in there and you're kind of thinking, I don't know if this is going to work, then it probably won't, which is sort of what happens in real life, isn't it? It just, yeah, it's exactly what happens in real life too, right? If you really... You know, you're going through the motions, but you don't really believe it. It's probably not going to work. And it's the same over there. So I'd said, you know, in that dream as well, because I became lucid and I went, I want to, I want to go to Sorath. I want to see Sorath. If he's, if he's available, I want to see him. And when I emerged through the wall, the same thing happened. And I was plunging down what felt like an elevator shaft. And it was quite dark to start with. And that is a terrifying feeling. Let me tell you, you're plummeting down a, what seems like a bottomless pit. Um, yeah, in free fall and boy, is that scary. And so you really have to trust that this is where, what you're doing, where you're going and allow yourself to fall like that. And, and in fact, you can even will yourself like fall even faster, right? Um, because the natural instinct is to struggle and to try to break that fall, right? <laughs> and instead, you have to let that, let it happen, right? And go with it. And, that, and that's very, very scary. And it was the same thing that I described previously, where you're passing through these invisible kind of barriers and emerging into different dimensions. And that one, oh man, it's so... one one dimensional area was kind of like being underwater you know with like rocky caverns and rocky like and you and you're in you're in this deep almost lightless tunnel and you can see the rock walls appearing and disappearing and so on around you you know and then coming out of that i was in outer space and passing by i don't know satellites and and planetoids and ships like that were out there and then passing through another sort of a barrier and going through an area that was like going through a labyrinth and all the beings that were inside that area were infested with nanites they were part um, synthetic and part like real flesh and I don't know man they man machine kind of really hard to oh my god so weird so inhuman so um the terrifying thing is that they still had sort of like a dimension or, or not dimension but you could tell that they were somehow still alive you know but they didn't they didn't have souls like we do they but they did have intelligence and some of them were able to see me, perceive me, and they actually started to give chase, which was rather terrifying. And as more and more of them joined that chase, I started thinking, oh my God, what have I done? You know, when I thought, you know, you need to keep going here. And yeah, I hit this area that was like there was a stargate there or something, this wormhole. And I went through that and popped out into another area where it was like deep space for a while and then I saw a planet like I was moving in on this big planet and then falling towards it falling towards it falling towards it and 
eventually, you know, you're looking down on a continent and you're whipping through clouds. And I mean, this is all happening and I'm just going, holy shit. And partly thinking like, am I going to just like splatter on impact, you know, but somehow I didn't, you know, and I wound up um, coming in for a landing in a big open plaza with lots of buildings and there was lots of people around and nobody seemed to pay me any um, attention. I mean, a few glanced at me, but they, they weren't really that interested. They were just like, whatever. And they were going about their business. And yes, they were different. They, they were, they were definitely human and they were tall. Most of them were taller than me. Like the women were usually like six, one, or six two, and then the men were about six four, you know, six five. And I was definitely small. There were a few women that were around my height. I mean, I'm almost six foot myself, but they were bigger. They were bigger than me. A lot. The majority of them were bigger than me. And so, I started walking and along this plaza and just looking at the sites and the buildings and the, the buildings were wild because they were very different from what we know. They were much more organic. They were more integrated with like natural um, things. So it wasn't like, like we have these sterile sort of city blocks with very little greenery and theirs was a lot of greenery that's integrated with the buildings. And the buildings themselves are not rectangular necessarily. There was pyramids and other organic kind of shapes. Uh, it's just much more beautiful, like really organic and beautiful. And uh, some of it was more like what you would have seen in ancient times with, you know, the big pillars and big plazas and just and statues. And um, yeah, it was really pretty. And I went through these big double doors, this sort of a giant opening, and I went into one of these bigger buildings, which was kind of like, gosh, I don't know, like, it was definitely a public, more public building. And inside you had different kinds of shops where people were, you know, bartering goods and services. And uh, some of the things that I went past were like restaurants. And you could see entertainment on stages that were in there, like uh, cabarets almost. And so I'm walking down now. It's very busy in there. There's lots of people. And I noticed a man striding along. And he was tall, really handsome. He had long, silvery kind of blonde hair. And um, he was he was definitely muscular and big, but he wasn't like a like a... Um, like a wrestler big. He was more like a, um, I don't know, like just a really fit man like you'd see in the army or you'd see, you know, so, uh, and he was, he was walking along. He was about half a head taller than a lot of the people in the crowd. And he suddenly snapped his head around and looked and he saw me. It was like he sensed me first and then he snapped his head around and saw and then his eyes were on me and he did this incredible stage like you know double look right like and his his jaw dropped in surprise and then he strode right up to me and he saying he was Zola he goes what are you doing here and then he he said come with me and he grabbed me by the hand and he took me into this he took me into a more quiet section and he said how did you get here? How did you get here? Oh my God. He said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, I came to see you. And, and, uh, you know, he wasn't unhappy to see me, but he was definitely like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I wasn't expecting you kind of thing. Um, and that time, yeah, he wasn't tanned. He, his hair was about down to his elbows. Yeah, it was really interesting. So anyway, um, we had a bit of a conversation after that, which I'm not going to share. And yeah, that was about that. So anyway, this is something new that I'm doing. Um, I've decided that when I get lucid, I am going to start doing this. I'm going to start looking for them, looking for my guardians. And 
right now. I want to, I want it. I'm putting it out there, you guys. I want to see you. <laughs> so anyway, I think that's about it for the, the two, the two dreams. It's interesting to have the memory of another dream whilst you're still in the first dream. <laughs> You know, and something happens in that dream and jogs your memory of another, right? And you start to kind of understand as you're going along in all that, that these things really are real and they're connected. We're dealing with different multiple dimensions all the time. Every one of us, we just are not aware of it. And I think that part of the key to becoming aware of it is to become lucid again, um, to practice lucidity, to and part of, part of what will help you become lucid in the dream is actually practicing this lucidity while you are awake. So throughout your day, just sometimes pause and just take a moment and really look around and, and say to yourself, you know, I'm awake right now. Like I'm really, I'm here, you know, feel the solidity of the table in front of you or, you know, smell that breeze that's coming in through the window of pines and, and needles and earth, you know, or maybe wood smoke if you're real lucky and you're somewhere where there's a fireplace and, um, you know, or wherever it is that you are and just really take a moment and look around and kind of um, feel and sense that environment. And sort of make a habit of doing that because when you are asleep and dreaming, you will do the same thing. And that can quite possibly trigger a lucid moment for you because you'll look around and you'll suddenly go, oh my God. And you'll realize, you know, uh, this place doesn't exist as far as I know in the waking world. Certainly I've never been here in the waking world. You know, you're, I'll give you an example. Um, and it's one that's stayed with me for a long time. And I had this dream a long time ago, and I still remember this part of it. I'm walking along what looked and felt like uh, a rustic country road. You know, there's like the, the two uh, wheel marks uh, that's rutted, you know, and, and it's dirt. And in between is the grass, you know, in between the ruts, and then on either side are the banks. And it's all grassy and there's yellow and white flowers in the field and it's like grassland and it's stretching away on either side of the road and then up, up ahead and on the right hand side you can see like a handmade stone wall coming into view and when I got to the stone wall and I leaned over to have a look at what was on the other side there was nothing um, except this absolutely massive space and I realized that whatever this thing is that I'm on, it's actually floating in the air about 15 to 20,000 feet up in the air, like a floating island. And the real landscape is like way down there. And there's actually clouds passing underneath the, the floating island that I'm on. And somehow, yeah, it's, it's not like you can't breathe. I don't need a mask, you know? But maybe there was a force field, I don't know, um, keeping the oxygen stable around this little island of land. <laughs> um, who knows if it was really land? It might have been the, the top part of a, of a ship, you know? I've, I've, I've seen those, too. Um, anyway, and I was looking off to the west, and the sun was behind me, and it was lighting up like... I mean, you could see the curvature of this planet, you know, that's how high up you could start to see how it is actually curving and you could see the, the cloud. I mean, it was a really long drop. And I actually have, um, I can't forget what that's called, you know, but I'm not, I'm one of those people that's not got a head for heights. I don't like heights. And but yet it didn't bother me to look out, to lean on this stone wall that was, um, it was so wide that, that you would have to stretch out your arms to be able to hook your fingers over the other side of the wall. So it wasn't like a, like a narrow little wall and you didn't feel safe. You felt pretty safe, you know, like that wall's definitely going to keep you from falling. And yeah, but the view was just 
it was just something. It's funny I said that, you know, that my arms are stretching out, and yet I can remember leaning over and looking straight down. I must have crawled up on the wall as well, and then pulled myself back again, going, that's a little bit too much for me <laughs> to look down like that. Oh my god. Um, and then I climbed up on the wall. All right, because, yes, my first, re my first reaction was to go, oh my goodness, you don't want to fall from that. That's terrifying. And then I said to myself, yeah, but this is, this is a lucid dream, right? I can do what I want. And so I went and I stood on the edge of that wall and then I jumped off. <laughs> I jumped off and I flew. I wasn't, I wasn't falling. I was actually flying. And let me tell you, that was a pretty amazing dream. And I hope. I hope that you people out there will have amazing dreams like that too, because, you know, there's a lot more to this world than just this hideous nine to five of useless, pointless labor. I don't know, a lot of it is just absolutely useless labor, you know, and you're just producing for some faceless elite boob that's collecting all the money and you get peanuts and you do all the work and it's just a such a slavery system I really really resent it anyway oh and the other thing that I wanted to mention about about that landscape was that there were colors there that don't exist in real life here and I remember standing on that wall looking down and around and going um, it was that time of the day you know when you're starting to see as the sun's starting to go down and you're seeing you know the clouds are starting to take on different colors and such yeah there was there was colors there that were present that you don't see here and it was just this supremely beautiful beautiful place and view and moment and I know I had that dream probably several years ago or more, and yet I can still remember it vividly, so. Um, and I certainly would like for, you know, you guys to have dreams like that too, you know? Anyway, yeah, I think I'm done telling you about the dream. Yeah, so, if you want to keep working on your lucidity, you know, take the time to record your dreams. Like, for example, I really should have gotten up. <laughs> I'm one to talk, right? <laughs> but, yeah, I should have gotten up when I first woke up, woken up, and come straight over here and recorded that dream, because then I could tell you a little more about what was going on before I became lucid. It's kind of there, tickling in my, my head, and I'm mm, trying to focus on it. Mm. Yeah, I can't. I, I told myself, yeah, you'll remember it. Your memory's really good. This bed's so comfortable, and I'm just gonna. I still have time. I'm gonna go back to sleep for a while. Um, and yeah, I woke up and most of it's gone, unfortunately. <laughs> so, I want to talk, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm not perfect, right? And, you just do what you can every every day, every morning, and just write this stuff down. Write it down. Write it down. Or record it. Or whatever. Write it down. It's actually really good to keep a written log as well. And I do both. Sometimes if they're very, very interesting, I'll record them like this so that you guys can hear them. And then other times, I, I don't really want to share them, and I'll just write them down instead. So what happens there is, again, you're training your mind to remember, and as you do that, your, your recall will start to improve, right? And the whole point of it is that as you train your memory, train yourself that you want to remember it, as you practice different techniques of maintaining awareness and being grounded in the moment, that awareness will come in handy for you when you are in those other dimensions because you'll suddenly become aware while you're there and you'll suddenly go, oh my god, you know. <laughs> and it's like having a veil lifted and suddenly you realize that the world is a much bigger place than you thought and much more interesting. 
Anyway, on that note, I'm going to let y'all go and have a great day wherever you are. And yeah, take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> and sweet dreams. Talk to you soon. Bye.